sorry late, so I'm going to kind of rush through this a little bit. It was already a shortish talk, and I'm just going to go through it and hopefully you'll catch up and keep up. But, and given that most of you are doing functional stuff elsewhere, most of this talk is going to be only skimming the relevance to you anyway. So, you've got functional programming, and you've been looking at it at home, and it's been great, and it's this golden, blinding light of purity that you're seeing, the structure is going to be amazing. You're going to do good things with this. You're going to change the world. Ed Komet is your new spirit animal. You're going to go out there and convince people that there is a better way for them to do your jobs. So you've gone on one of these courses or something, and you now know how to functor your applicatives and to map your monoids and stuff, and you've got this down. You're a functional master. You can do any of it. And then you go and rock up to work on Monday and you are writing PHP or Java or some horrible life-hating thing that really does not inspire confidence in the, in the future for mankind. So you talk to your dev lead and your dev lead says, no, this is an academic thing that I have no idea what you're talking about. You go and talk to the sysadmins and they don't want a piece of it. They're, this is too new, it's too strange. They have no idea how to maintain it. You go and talk to management, and before you even get through the door, you remember that was a bad idea, because they don't care anyway. So, you're at about your third cup of coffee for the day, and you're contemplating the best way to drown yourself in it, when this numpty comes through the door. <laughs> he wants a script. He wants a script that hits a website and downloads it to a CSV. It's something stupid and simple. We shouldn't even need it, but this is your opportunity. This numpty doesn't care if it's in Haskell, he doesn't care if it's in Scala or whatever. The dev lead's never going to see it, because you're going to have this thing done so fast it's not even going to need a code review. The sysadmins are never going to get to object, because this is going to be on a serve before it matters. And by the time it's out there, you've got corporate approval. <laughs> you get to be one of those people who say that I've got Haskell in production. <laughs> you're a winner! <laughs> so, you knuckle down, you start up, you make the main module, you've got main is an I.O. and you get to the first line, you need to take an argument and you have not a clue where to start because none of these courses looked at it. So, you go to the web, you go to Stack Overflow and you search it. <laughs> you find someone's stupid blog where they've just blasted code onto a page and every fourth paragraph has, see it's easy written at the end. <laughs> and by the time you're done you want to show them how easy it is, how easily accidents can happen. <laughs> And before you know it, half an hour's gone by and you've just figured out a reasonable way to handle arguments coming to your program. But the numpties come back and they're getting a little upset because they wanted the script. And, you know, you've taken a bit too long, but it's going to be amazing. So you make your excuses. You had some environmental problems with some marsh gas or something. and You'll have it done in no time. You swear it'll be okay. Now you need to read a website. Back to Stack Overflow. You don't know what you're doing yet, you haven't seen how to do this. Then, an hour's passed, and this guy's threatening to um, uh, claggy your parents, and he wants the script now. It's not a good idea to delay him because he'll hurt you. <laughs> so, at this point, you have a whole blanket of depression that settles across you, and you realize that this just isn't going to happen, and then suddenly you black out. You come to three minutes later, and you've got a perfectly working Perl script written that <laughs> does everything, and it's perfect, and the numpty's happy again, but you've got this deep-seated feeling of shame and despair and dirtiness that just will not wash off. <laughs> so, we want to stop that from happening. So today we're going to go and do a review of a whole bunch of dirty little Haskell scripts, which do a bunch of common tasks like reading files, writing files, hitting websites and stuff. And then when you get hit with this situation where you think, I can do that in Haskell, you probably can by copying these and then replacing the middle parts. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we roll. Yeah, dirty. We're rolling dirty. <laughs> uh, so that's the easy part of the talk over. Now I've actually got to show code and stuff. So, we're going to walk through a bunch of scripts, and they're mostly going to be typical Linux scripts, basic ones. Um, the last couple are all uh, uh, contrived ones, but to start with, we're going to do Echo. 
And, and I should mention, first of all, all of these scripts, I've been explicit with the imports, so if you see a function there and it's not mentioned at the top of the file in the imports, it's coming out of Prelude, so you should be out of find, hopefully. But for all the curly ones and all the tools that you need to use, they're mentioned in the imports, so just find inside the script. So first script we're looking at is Echo. If anyone who doesn't know what it does, you pass Echo some arguments and it prints those arguments. It's the print line for Bash. So, our first problem. We need to take some arguments. And the simplest way to get arguments in Haskell is using get args out of system environment. It gives you back a list of strings and we can deal with a list of strings. We can mutate them or reorganize them, take the head or the tail or all kinds of crazy things. You know how to do that, you did sys194 or something. So, you've got args. Achievement unlocked, you've got your first step. <laughs> now you need to print them back out. And you have this cryptic named function called putStringLine, which puts a string out to standard out. It's not named printLine or anything, which is a little bit strange and a little bit confusing if you're coming from another language like Python or something, where the names just made sense. And there is all, it's confused it even further, there is another function called print in Haskell, but print isn't what you want. There's an, all objects have a, or all data, most good data types have an instance of something called show, which gives you a readable representation. And if you put a string through print, you end up with all the control characters printed out in an encoded fashion, which probably isn't what you wanted. You probably wanted the new lines to be new lines instead of backslash n. So, put string line, prints things to standard out. And that's great, we have echo. First script done, taking arguments and printing them back out. Next one, cat. Cat takes a file name, or more like a list of file names, and prints all of them out to the standard, out to standard output. Cat is short for concatenate, it joins things together. So much like the previous, fu previous file, we read some arguments, nothing new there. With these arguments, they're file names. We need to read those files to somewhere that we can use them. And for that, we have read file. It's part of Prelude, so it's really easy to get to. And it takes the entire contents of the file and puts them inside a string. Once we have them in a string, we loop over those strings because we have multiple files, and we print either we put string line those strings back out to standard output. <coughs> now, Initially looking at this, it sort of seems like there might be a memory problem because when you've got that 5 gig log file on that 3 gig log file and you accidentally put them both through at once, you just ran out of memory. But you don't, because read file's lazy. Read file produces a string, which has probably been ingrained into it now, is a list of characters. That list is lazy. As you reach the end of each chunk of the characters, it reads the next chunk and just moves swiftly through memory. Put string lines consumes it. So, we have a bunch of loops which lazily lo read from a file and then print out each chunk as it's available. Nice and simple, we don't blow our stack, which is good. And we got all of that for free without having to deal with byte stream IO buffer crap that you normally would have to in Java or something. So that's cool, that's the second script. We can now read files. Third script, head. Head prints out the first couple of lines from a file. My fingers suck tonight. Go there. <clears throat> That's the one. Okay, reads the first couple of lines of a file. By default, ten lines. But sometimes you want more, sometimes you want less, so you pass in an option that gives it a number of lines. Unlike the previous scripts, we now have a more complicated argument structure. We've got options being passed in alongside our file names. And we're lazy as all hell, so we're not going to go and take get args and then try and parse these out ourselves and interpret them and do all that work and code. It's a, we're probably going to get it wrong anyway, and we don't want to write it, we don't have the time. So we're going to go and use something called optparse applicative, which lets you build parses for a parses... Stop jumping it lets you build parses for command line options. First step in using it is you create a data structure for holding your options. In the simple case here, we've got a file name and we have a number of lines that we want to consume. Give them some logical types, our file name's a string and our number of lines is an integer. Once we have a data type, we then go and create a parser for it using optparse applicative. 
A single parser for all of the arguments is built off of multiple little parsers. And the little parsers are provided in the form of helpers inside of Parserplexiv, and you have ones for all the major types you would expect to have on a, sub, on a command line script. You have positional arguments, you have flagged options, you have switches, all, the th all nice little helper things to get you through. So to demonstrate, we've got the first one here is taking a positional argument, and then the second one is taking a flagged option. Option's got another thing after an auto, which looks strange until you understand what it is. We're not telling option what type of thing it's going to read from, the, what type of variable it's going to read from the command line. It's able to look up at our data structure and see that we probably want an int, but it doesn't know how to read an int from the standard input. What auto does is goes and looks for an, inst for an instance of something called read, which is available in the, pre in the prelude, which tells the event which gives it a way to read from, read from a str string into your more complex data type. So in the prelude, there is a read instance to go from string to int, which it can use to convert and then know if it failed a conversion or throw an error from it. <coughs> ah. So yes, with auto and the int type inference to say that we have an int, option is able to read an integer from the command line. These, these, singular, ah, these single argument parsers, we then pass a bunch of meta variables to. Typically, yeah, these give it enough information to find where it is on command, in the command line arguments, as well as give the help text which is necessary to the user to understand how to use your script. And you've got such meta variable operators as, as the short name, the long name, something to describe the, da the type of data you expect to be passed in, and a help text, and a default value if it's relevant. In the case of line num, we want the default value to be 10. Once you've got a bunch of these single, single argument parsers, you can bind them all together into one big parser using the angle dollar and the angle bum symbols, which you don't have to understand at all. Just remember that angle dollar comes before angle bum because <laughs> first you get the money and then you get the bum. <laughs> <laughs> But there's plenty of, uh, if you go into off parser applicatives, hackage page, there's plenty of examples of how to do this. It's fairly easy to follow. Once you've got a parser for all of your arguments, you then go and wrap it in a further parser. This one gives information for the help text for, that your entire program is going to output, such as the program's name and a piece of header text. So to show you what this looks like, uh, this was head. From those two, you're kidding me. <laughs> Did you forget to import a quote from the up parser preview? Did I forget to import? Long from up parser preview. I must have somehow. I thought these compiled. Yeah. But then I should know better than to run code during a talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we get a useful help message which has things to tell the user what to do, the flag names, and it's too small for people to read. But yeah, we get a help message which looks very similar to most, uh, to most Linux scripts, and we didn't have to write any help, me any help messages. It's just the text for the individual options in our parser, and our parser clicked took care of the rest. Which is great, because we're lazy, and that's a lazy way to get help text and usability stuff for your users. So, once we have our complete parsers built up, we run them rather unceremoniously with exec parser, which sucks off the command line arguments, pushes them through the parser, and gives you back the data type you defined all the way back at the beginning, and then you have all of your options. Now that we have a list of files, we can go and vote that. Yes, now that we have a list of, now that we have a single file, we can go and read that file, like we did in the previous script. Because it's a lazy, because that string is a lazy, is a is lazily loaded from the file, we can then treat it like we normally would a lazy list, run lines over it, and not expect that to evaluate the entire file at once. Take the first however many number of lines we wanted without evaluating the entire file, and then print them back out, and the program terminates, and it's all good and simple. Yay! We can now parse complex arguments. Next script. T. 
T is a script that accepts the standard input that is available and prints it back out to standard output, but also prints it out to a list of named files. So say you were listening to the output from some horrendous web server that didn't have logs itself, that didn't have real logs, and you wanted to run it on a screen just so you could see when it crashed, you could have the output come to the screen and you could use T to then push that out to a log file as well so you have records of what happened for later. So this, in this script we're going to explore how to open handles to write to them so that we can write files out. We parse in, parse in, actually there is something new in the options for this one. We parse in our options much as before but because we have a list of file names we're going to add a combinator to our positional argument um, parser. It's two combinators to care about, some and many. Many accepts zero to, me zero to many um, arguments and some accepts one to many arguments. Yeah, you just wrap up your, wrap up your um, positional, you wrap up your single argument parser in that and it lets you take many of them instead so you can consume it as a list. And in our data type, acceptably, we have said we wanted a list. So that's how it works, and it's a simple modification to make that, that a simple change to the general... It's easy to use. <laughs> so, that gets our options in there, which gets us our list of file names. One of the other options we're taking in is the append mode, which is a simple switch to say whether we want to append to the files or we want to write new copies of files, write to empty files. And that's the first thing that we need for writing to a file. We need to do instead, we need to figure out which mode we want to do it in. So we determine that, and then we go and use the function openfile. Openfile comes out of the library system.io, and it takes a open mode, being a append or write, and a file name, and gives you back a file handle. And a file handle is much like it is in any other language, or a standard in is, or a standard out. They are I.O. handles that you can push data onto and pull data off of, depending on which mode they're open in. These ones are output file handles, so we'll be pushing data onto them. Next thing the file needs to do is start reading stuff from standard in. Because standard in is so common, there are plenty of functions out there that already read by default from standard in. You don't have to go and open a standard in handle or look after it in any special way. You can just use get contents. What get contents tries to do is capture the entirety of standard in all the way to the end of the stream and push it into a single string. Much like read file, this is lazy. So you can consume the standard input as it's entering a program before the string is finally being completed. And we do just that. We put, for each of our file handles, we, can, we go and try to print on them. And to push data onto a file handle, we use h put string line. This is exactly like put string line from put string line from the prelude, except you also give it a file handle to write to, and it writes your string to the file handle exactly like you asked it to, which is great and easy. We're adding standard out to our list of file handles so that we also echo the output back out to standard out. And finally, we make sure that we close the file handles because if you don't close them, the data will not be flushed to them and they will not finish writing and you will lose the last X number of lines, whatever the buffer size ended up being on your particular version of GHC. And I feel like I rushed over that, so is there any questions quickly? Yep. Why is open file in quotes? Okay. Um, open file's in quotes because it's indicating that it's in infix. Normally you would use open file like open file handle file name. Yeah. But handle then mode. Handle then mode? Yeah. Whoops. So no file name. It produces a handle for you, so you yeah, you need the name then. Oh um, yeah. Yes, thank you. So normally you'd use it like that, but for any function in Haskell, you can make it in, you can make it infix by adding that, by adding those slanted quotes into it. So you can use it like <clears throat> so 
your first one's backwards. Sorry? Your, so your first one's got the argument split. Yeah. There you go. That makes more sense. Yeah. <laughs> so you can make an infix by surrounding it with those uh, with those quote marks. If you then go and surround that with parentheses, the it creates a section, section which will that which the mis ah. it takes a it creates a section which is a function which takes the missing argument space. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So I can say I want to, yeah, I'm just using it to flip the arguments around. So is that all for this one? Um, so does the output here get output line by line or character by character? Line by line or buffer size by buffer size, depending on how long your lines are. Oh, OK. So the, all the file handles in Haskell, from my experience so far, I don't know what the actual buffer size is that gets compiled into GHC by default, but they seem to flush either on new line or on when they hit the buffer size, whether that's 100 characters or 300 characters or whatever. So, yeah, if I was to actually run it. <coughs> and I wait for it to load. Then you get line by line and then eventually okay. quit out and it would also be in the file. So yeah, that's what I was getting to with the, that's what I was trying to drive home with the laziness part because it, it does go line by line as it gets the buffers flushed through. So okay, next script. Also needs to be pretty good. Okay, curl. Hopefully you've all used this. This reads websites and prints out their bodies. We read our arguments so much as we did before. There's nothing new in the in our parse applicative here. Then we go and start talking to a website. To talk to a website, we're going to use a library called rec, which is spelled with a W, like this. And, and it's an obvious play on the word request. Rec, like most HTTP libraries these days, has all of its functions defined using the same HTTP verbs we're all familiar with here, get, put, post, delete, and they just run and work. And if you go and read the tutorials for rec, you see that they just call get with a URL and it just runs and it's all good. And that's great and simple and easy. It takes care of the socket creation, all of the session handling, everything for you. But it's really bad when you want to do a whole bunch of requests at once because creating a session and opening a socket turns out to be pretty bloody slow. And in Haskell, it will take upwards of half a second. So if you're going to do a whole bunch of different requests, you want to handle the session yourself, which, while easy in rec, isn't covered in any of the tutorials. So if you go to use the library, just remember how to take care of your sessions. And you take care of your sessions by calling with session, which takes a function in to which it supplies a session variable, which it will then clean up for you after your function completes. So now that we've got a session, we go and use verb named verb we go and use a different set of verb name functions which are provided by rec session, but they behave exactly like the ones which you'd see in the tutorial. You just provide them also a session variable. So to use get, we provided a session and we provided a string of a URL string. And it goes and does its thing and gets you back a response body. And that jumped around because I hit the wrong keys. So for each of the URLs that we passed in the options, we go and do a get request and we get back a rec response. Once we have the rec response, what we really want is the body of the response because the response has all the usual things. It has a status code, a set of headers, maybe some other things that you're, prepared, that you're trying to capture back from the web server. And unlike most other data records you've probably experienced in Haskell, accessing the Accessing the elements of a rec, for a rec response isn't done just with a straight function. They use a library called Lens, which we could devote multiple talks to and you'd still be wondering how it works. But the important part you have to take away is that to use rec's element accessors, you must first use caret dot and use that to apply the accessor function. Then you get back a response body. That response body is a byte string, which is a low-level data representation. We're going to be stupid and treat it like it's always UTF-8 without having looked at the headers. And once it's in UTF-8, we're going to use something that will print, we will use a version of put string line that will print a UTF-8. And yay, we've printed out the response bodies. And that all worked great. Is there any questions about that one? 
Yeah. I've seen traverse for him and math him a number of times. Are you using all of them on purpose or is there a reason? They were there to grab. Okay. Oh. Traverse was the only one which had any thought put into it. The rest of them were just a way to loop. Okay. So okay, next part, next script. And we're finally getting to a contrived example that does something mediumly complex. Mm. This is the worst Reddit client in existence. <laughs> <laughs> it goes to r slash all and it selects the top 10 listings and prints them out to a CSV, the most readable <laughs> format in existence. Well and dirty. Now you can read Richard dirty. <laughs> so, Sucking our options like we normally would, and then we go and go, go and use rec like we did in the last file. There is a big difference though. Reddit's going to respond with, a respond with a bunch of JSON stuff, and we're going to want to decode the JSON stuff, so we're going to use a library called ASIN to do it. Um, yeah, we're going to use a library called ASIN, which is cool, and rec has a bunch of helper functions to make it easier for you to use ASIN. So to make ASIN read, for, read some JSON, First of all, we go and we go and create a data structure. You want this data structure to mimic the JSON structure as closely as possible, just for ease of use. And because the Reddit data structure is long, it's like four levels deep. So I created a big nested data structure for it. Once you have this data structure and it matches, but and you're happy with it. And by the way, the data structure doesn't have to have every key you expect to have in the JSON. It only has to have the keys that you care about, so you can do a partial decode of the JSON. Once you have your data type, you then need to go and create some instances of some type classes for ASIN. ASIN has from JSON and to JSON type classes, which are for translating from JSON and to JSON. Here we're deserializing, so we want from JSON. And if you're so pleased, you can go and build these by hand like you were building a parser, similar to what we're doing in OpParse Applicative, and walk through the JSON structure yourself. And you have to do this when Reddit stupidly makes one of their, one of their keys data, which is a reserved word in Haskell, so I couldn't make it the name of one of my fields. But, once data is out of the way, you can go and be lazy again. Thanks to, all the way at the top, derived generics, which is a language plugin for a language plugin for GHC. It allows libraries to examine details about the about your data structure that are usually deleted at compile time and generate functions at compile time. So, ASIN has logic built into it that so long as your data type derives generic, you can go and just create a from JSON which into which uses the names of your data records fields to that which expects the names of your data record fields to match the fields in the JSON record and then it builds you an instance and does all of it for you and it works really well and you can do that all the way down your data structure except where they include data again and you finally get four layers deep of a data of a data structure which can all be into which ASIN knows how to translate from JSON then we go and use it Back at the top here, I passed a function in to get into with session rather than call rather than calling inline a, another get function or something like that. What that function is doing is the get function. It takes a session, and we're going to be returning a rec response that contains a Reddit listing. By default, a rec response contains a byte string, the low-level data type, but there are transformers inside the rec library which lets it which lets it change what the body is into something which is more manageable. So we go and do the we go and do our get request like we did before, and then we then we call the function as JSON on the response. As JSON goes and looks at a meaningful type signature near it, in this case that we expect a Reddit listing to be inside the response, checks that Reddit listing has an instance of from JSON, and if it does, transforms the request body into a Reddit listing and runs ASIN on it and everything. And it just works. You don't have to tell it what... From the signatures, it's how to figure out everything. You don't have to try and wire anything in, anything together any more than 
you see here. If the JSON parsing fails, which is absolutely unimaginable because the web is perfect and we would never ever get the data structure wrong, what ASIN spits out, what ASIN uses to handle the errors is something called monad error, which you can go and read about further if you want to understand how to actually get the errors out. But because we're writing dirty scripts, the only relevant part is it's going to crash the script with a message about it could not pass the JSON. And because it's a dirty script, that's perfectly acceptable. <laughs> So no error handling for us and less code to write. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we're pure. <laughs> so, we've done our get request, we've passed the JSON, we have a data structure that we can deal with. Now that we have this, we go and visit the request body, the response body like we did last time. We take we walk through that to get the top 10 listings all the way down the bottom of the data structure. Then we want to output it to a CSV file. For, outputting to see it, for dealing with CSV files at all, we're going to use a library called Cassava. And Cassava works somewhat similarly to ASIN, at least somewhat similarly to the way that we're using ASIN. First, you go and define a data type. And because I'm lazy, I'm going to reuse one of the Reddit's, or Reddit's existing data types. From this data type, you go and create a couple of instances. In the fact, what we need for this CSV to work is two named record, which will figure out the header names based upon your field names, and you need default ordered, which figures out the ordering of your columns based on the ordering of the elements inside your record. Cassava, again, is familiar with generics, so we can just go and derive these instances for you and just make everything work. You can go and write them yourself, and you can change the field names as you please, or change the ordering, or change a whole bunch of other things about the CSV if you want, but it's easier just to make the compiler do the work and generics figure it all out for you. So, with those two instances, we can call encode default ordered by name from Cassava, <coughs> which is a mouthful, but it's the function in Cassava that just does everything based on the instances. There's a whole bunch of other encode functions in Cassava that you pass in options like the ordering or transformers for the header names or things about do I put a space after the commas or do I replace the commas with pipes or something like that. This just does it well with defaults and does it with the least code possible, which is dirty, which is what I want. The other thing to know about Cassava is that everything it takes in and everything it writes out is a lazy byte string. So you have to go and use the I/O operations from the from the data byte string lazy library. Thankfully, they play exactly like all the I/O operations we've seen previously in System I/O, and we just use them to write files as we have in previous as we have in app. We use them to write out the CSV contents like we have in the previous scripts. Any questions about that one? Yep. Um, to use Cassava the way you did there, did you have to use the um, deriving generic um, option? Yep. Right, okay, that's a mistake I made. Yeah. yeah. If you're using generics anywhere, and yeah. Yeah, if you just want to create an instance and you don't want to write any code next to the instance, yeah, generics. Any others? Cool, next file. Data importer. In this file, we're going to read a CSV and then we're going to put it into a database because Jack over in sales can't use a computer so he gives you a CSV one day and you do it and then the next day he gives you an Excel file and nothing works ever again but we work in corporate, we know that happens. <laughs> so, much like before we go and pass in, our set, pass in all of our command line arguments and we're pulling in things like the database host name to connect to and the database, database name and our input CSV file. Build up our options parser like before, there's nothing new here. And eventually we run it. What we didn't take in the options parser was the user's password for the DB because we don't want them to type, type it in in plain text on the command line because it'll probably end up in logs somewhere and that's bad even for a dirty script. <laughs> so, we're going to go and create a blind prompt for them to enter in the password. And we're going to do it with more functions from system.io. So, we use put string without line this time so it doesn't write a new line at the end of your string to start up a prompt of password. We forcibly flush it out because we didn't reach a new line so standard out didn't flush so that we actually display something to the user. Then we turn off standard in echoing. 
Normally when you're at a command prompt and you type something in on your keyboard and stand in, it gets echoed straight back out by whatever read line library is being used. We turn off echoing so your password does not appear for everyone peeking over your shoulder. We then read a single line of input, turn echoing back on, and add a new line to the end of it so it looks like the user pressed enter. And there we go, we have a password that we read blindly. And that goes from Stack Overflow. Probably turn off the echoing before you print the prompt. Yeah. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Just <laughs> okay. okay, so that gets us our password without revealing it to the world. Now we go and read it in our CSV file. Once again, cassava only deals in lazy byte strings, so we go and use the, the functions from the data byte string lazy library to, go, to read our file in. And then we go and decode the CSV using cassava's decode, no, not cassava's decode CSV, it's mine. <laughs> nope, that's where I want to go. So, decoding a CSV. Just like encoding one, we first go and create a data type that's going to store what comes out of our CSV file. All of your fa ah. all the basic primitive style data types for Haskell are understood. So you've got text double, all the te all the simple textual representable ones are all supported thanks to the read instances in Prelude. So don't go and look to see if something's supported that you're trying to do. Just go and try it. It probably will work unless you think it can't be stored inside of the CSV file, in which case it probably won't work. So we go and create a data type, derive generic from it because we want it. And then we go and create an instance of from named, named record. This is the opposite of to named record. This will look at the header, co the header, ah. it will go look at the title of the column in the CSV and try and put those into the correct element position in the record type that you've created. So it'll go and look for, for the item element, it'll go and look for something which has item written at the top of it, and so on. Which takes care of all of our concerns about how to read a CSV. So, we call decode by, decode by name from cassava, pass it the file contents, and make sure that there's a type signature nearby for it to know that it needs to go and look for a from named record instance from sale record, and it takes care of the rest. It decodes it, and if there's an error, it's not quite as nice as ASIN is. It's not going to just go and crash the program for us. What it, which is an interesting definition of nice. If we're being dirty and we're being lazy, it's nicer if it just did crash with an error. What it gives you back instead is an either structure, which you probably run into at some point during your studies, which has an error message on one side and all of your resulting data structures on the other. So, that's read our CSV in. Which is great. We now have data that we can go, go and put into the DB. We do a pattern match on the, on the E that we got back. <clears throat> if the E did fail, then we're going to be really dirty and print out the error message and then use a function called exit failure. This is from a library called system exit. It lets you exit with a non-zero status to say that my script was in error. And yeah, it's convenient, it's dirty, and you could probably deal with the errors better if you, play, if you cared enough about the use case of your application. Assuming it didn't fail though, we go and look at the sales records which we got out of the CSV. Before we can do anything with them though, we need to go and make a connection to the DB. For talking to the DB, we're going to use PostgreSQL simple. And if PostgreSQL isn't your favourite kind of DB, then there's very, very similar libraries for MySQL and SQLite that, will, that have almost exactly the same API. And if you're an MSSQL or an Oracle person, then your business makes enough money and you can go and hire some trainers and you know you're worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so, to make a connection to a DB, you either supply it with a connection string, which people have probably seen in black magic textbooks somewhere, which is the uh, DB colon postgres colon hostname split up thing that you can never ever interpret and you have to go and look online to figure out what it is. Or you go and create a connect info. A connect info is a data structure that stores the DB's, the DB's name, the DB's host name, the DB's port, your username, and your password, and means that Postgres Simple can then go and do something with it. 
So we create a post, we create a connect info, we pass it into connect, and we get back a connection that works. Once we have a connection, we want to be able to run for SQL statements against it. There are better SQL libraries out there which will type check your SQL and build them up from Haskell data types and infer the correct output types which are expected to come from the database, but we're dirty and lazy so we're just going to use raw SQL. And these libraries let you execute raw SQL statements, which is good. So to do an, insert, an insertion of a sale record, we give it a raw SQL and a list of, a list of um, query params. It will return a success value represented as an int like you would expect to get back raw from a DB anyway. You can also do queries this way. What you get back is a tuple, and somewhere in the processing of that tuple, you'll have type signatures that infer what type of variable is in, is in what position of that tuple. If those type signatures then don't line up, then at runtime it crashes because it says Postgres returned you something dirty. But you can do queries and you can deal with them just fine. So, that inserts a single record, but we have many records. So we want to run many insertion records, and because we're not quite as dirty as we wish we could be, we're going to run that inside of a transaction. So similar to what rec lets you do with the session, PostgreSQL Simple lets you call with transaction to produce a curated transaction inside your connection. It'll run the begin, the begin commit and it will, run, uh, it, will it will run the begin statement and it will run the commit statement for you. And if necessary, because you screwed up, it'll run the rollback statement for you. So we call with transaction with our connection, which then takes a function, which passes our connection into it. And we're just going to map over, the, map over our sales records and insert them one by one. If you really want, you can manually run the begin and the commits, but it's simpler and neater just to use with transaction. So, after all that, we run all of our insert statements and we have a list of successes that come back from Postgres. We're not going to bother to check them, we're just going to say that we were successful and exit. <laughs> and that's how dirty we can be to insert a CSV into a database. Is there any questions about that one? You were dirty and neat at the same time. Congratulations. That's for wins. Anyway, that's the last script. Um, these are all up on GitHub, and we'll add the URL to the meetup page about the to the comments on the meetup page. So yeah, that's everything. Yeah, any questions? Nope. Great. It's eight thirty, and we can do a beer.